Uh, Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Welcome to the ninth in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. Tonight, 65 years and a week after its first ascent, it's a Kanchenchunga special. I really hope you enjoy it. Kanchenchunga is the third highest mountain in the world at 8,586 metres high. It sits on the border between Nepal and Sikkim, and until 1852, it was briefly thought to be the highest mountain in the world. Of all the 8,000ers, it is the only one with a first ascent by British climbers, namely George Band and Joe Brown, in 1955, during an expedition led by Charles Evans. This was a couple of years after Everest, of course, but was a very different affair. First tonight, I'd like to introduce Leo Dickinson, one of the outstanding action sports filmmakers of today. Leo was recently looking through his treasure trove of interview footage and he stumbled across Joe Brown. Leo's here to introduce it. Thanks, Nick. Well, like most climbers in the 60s, there are only two names that stood out above the crowd. There was Don Willens and Joe Brown. Now, I'd never climbed with Joe, although I did let him beat me at darts in the Padan. But only really got to know him on the on the Hollywood film Five Days One Summer, directed by Fred Zinnemann and starring Paul Nunn playing Sean Connery. Uh, I had made a film about Willens in Patagonia attempting Torrey Egger, neighbour to Sarah Torrey, although it was made very difficult for me as a filmmaker because Don never actually touched the mountain. I decided to spice it up by introducing my favourite narrator, Ian McNaught Davis, to tell the story. Anyway, after I'd done that, uh, I later made a biographical film about Don, and Mac suggested we make a film about Joe. First, we needed to get Joe's story. So we spent a wonderful three days in Nantes, Paris, in, in Mac's Welsh cottage, listening to the master, telling his life story. So what you're going to hear tonight is Joe telling Mac and myself all about reaching the first ascent of the world's third highest mountain. We set off the next morning, per absolutely perfect weather. Um, the the snow was nice and hard, so that you know a couple of chips with the ice axe made a step. It was a bit hard to, to just kick in it. Also, that one of the things I'd learned about high altitude climbing was your step patterns are made for coming down rather than going up because if, if you just cut a set of diagonal steps at, at some point you will be cross-legged and off balance whereas if you do the double step you know one up one horizontal one up one horizontal it, it's absolutely automatic the stepping and you never go off balance and and so you you, you know that was a thing i I'd, I'd learned very early on from charles evans that you know you have to do this to make it easy for the porters but if you're going to be coming down feeling tired it's quite a good thing to do that going up as well but very soon we we got to where there was rock outcrops and we we made one false uh, uh, route finding error well we knew that at some time we had to go off the ramp to the right and we went off too quick and it was just impossible you know climbing to do at that altitude so we came back onto the ramp and it, it was decided I don't know it, it was probably obvious that I was going much better than George that I should I mean, I, I don't can't remember how far we'd gone when we reached this decision that I, it was better me being in the lead rather than, you know, him having to work hard because he, he thought that it was his extra size made his oxygen not quite as efficient, which may have had something to do with it. But a, a thing I remember doing was taking to the rock when, you know, when we, we got to where these rock ribs were I took to the rock and George very wisely kept in the snow because on the way down, staying in the snow was a lot easier than climbing back down the rock. And we, you know, climbed 
uneventfully, but really nice climbing, you know, slabby granite rock, perfect rock. And eventually we got onto the, the West Ridge into a, a, a sort of balcony place where you had absolutely stunning views, you know, in all directions. And we, we stopped there for, you know, Kendall milk, mint cake and a, a, a drink. And they, 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 quite often on, on high mountains, you look up and, you know, you can see what appears to be a summit, but quite often when you get onto that, there's another one behind and another one behind. And from this point we were at, we could see, you know, this rock wall uh, and the, the top of the rock wall, but you, you couldn't actually see beyond it. But, uh, however, we, we went on, and I, I think George uh, commented that we would have to turn back, you know, in a very short time, like in an hour, if we hadn't got to the top, because, the you know, time was getting on. And we could... We were climbing up on fairly easy, you know, mixed ground below this rock wall. And it, I saw this crack and I thought, well, you know, that looks pretty good to me. We'll, we'll go up there. So off I went. And it was, it, you know, it, was, it made you think, but its technical standard, I would have thought, at sea level would probably be about V-diff. Um, but, you know, it was the sort of thing that if you fell off, you know, it was a proper fall, not a roll down something. And I remember fixing a runner halfway up and then pulling over the top and there, were, there was just a snow cone about 20 feet away and that was it, we'd, we'd done it. And I shouted down to George and in a very short time he joined me and we spent probably about 10, 15 minutes taking pictures and then had to reverse back down this, of course, because I don't think there was anything immediately obvious for abseiling off. And we, we got down to just about where we'd had our, a little bit below where we'd had the rest and my oxygen ran out and I took it off without any feeling of... Um, you know, extra breathlessness and certainly climbing down wasn't any harder than it had been with it on. And, it, you know, it was a relief to get rid of the weight. And it, uh, probably within another 100 feet or 200 feet, George's ran out. And a thing that had happened during the way up, though, which I failed to mention, was... The, the oxygen set was misting up my goggles and once I got onto the rock I started lifting them up so that I could see and George had said, you know, put your goggles down which I'd done and then a bit higher up, done it again and the, it, we carried on down and... It, you know, there was there's no particular problem except that it was now getting dark, and as we got closer to the camp, we knew that uh, Norman Hardy and Tony Strether would be in the the camp because they were the backup that was going to do it the next day if we'd failed or it, even if we hadn't, and um, we shouted and they came out the tent and shone the lights and. We arrived back at the the tent and you know told them what we'd done, and it was soon after that that I felt the first symptoms of snow blindness, which is this terrible burning sensation, and it it is not an exaggeration to describe it as having your eyelids drawn out and packed with red or iron filings. And the, the pain is so much that there was no bedding for us. You know, the, the sleeping bag and the lilos were for the two that were going to go on. But now there were four of us inside this two-man tent that wasn't even erected well for two people. And we were sleeping just lying on the, 
the ground sheet on top of the ice. And I had no recollection of any cold discomfort at all. The pain in my eyes was just so great that I just rolled and rolled. I, I kept everyone awake, I'm sure, because I'd never stopped moving. And in the morning, I was totally blind. And George had me on a, a short rope and I felt my way all the way down the ramp uh, and the, he was making sure that I was safe. We went pretty slowly. And the, the other two went to the top with a bit of trepidation at the thought of climbing this difficult crack. But when they got there, they carried on along the wall and went round the corner and there was an easy snow ramp leading up to the summit. So they, you know, man, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, having climbed the crack, you know, I thought it was a better way to go to the top than just walking around the corner and going up a snow plod anyway. And uh, and as Doug Scott said, it's the highest crack climb in the world. <laughs> so thanks, Leo, for, for, for digging that out. That's a, that's a really great way to start things off. And uh, fantastic to see uh, uh, that advert for Kendall Mint Cake in there as well, I must say. Um, so next tonight, um, I'd like to introduce award-winning author Mick Conifrey. Mick has just completed his High Altitude trilogy of books on Everest, K2, and now Kanchenchunga. And this last book is entitled The Last Great Mountain. Over to you, Mick. Um, yes, yeah, so this is my latest book. Um, and um, I just want to start off by saying thank you very much to everybody who helped me with it. And uh, for tonight, to Phil Strether, who um, allowed me to use his dad's uh, photographs from 55. Uh, so without more ado, I'm going to go on to a, a PowerPoint. So the book is called The Last Great Mountain. And the interesting thing to start off with about Kanchenjunga is unlike Everest and K2, which are really very remote, uh, Kanchenjunga is visible, but visible from the town of Darjeeling, which is a very famous town in British India. This is a painting by Edward Lear. And unlike Everest and K2, climbers could come to Darjeeling, have a look at the southwest face, of uh, Kanchen Jr. and think about climbing it. Um, the first person to, to really have a major expedition to Kanchen Jr. was uh, Douglas Freshfield, who was a former Alpine Club president. He went to Kanchen Jr. interestingly not to climb it, but to do a grand tour around it. And his aim was to find what a feasible route was. He came back with amazing photographs from Italian photographer Vittorio Sella and a very good map. Um, the first people to actually try to climb it, it were in, in 1905, six years later. He would have kind of been appalled by it, really, uh, because the, the, the two, the co-leaders were uh, Jules Jaco Guillermo, who was a Swiss climber, and Alester Crowley, the sort of bad boy of British climbing. And um, they had been to K2 in 1902, three years earlier. That hadn't gone very well. Um, they did better on Kanjunga in 1905, but the expedition ended in disaster and controversy. Um, this is a photograph um, which shows the kind of the, the end of it. By this time Crowley had left. Um, one of the Swiss climbers called Alexis Pash, two uh, porters and one of their servants um, died in an accident and uh, this is a, a fantastic photograph from Jaco Guillermo of um, the porters lowering down um, Pash's body. Um, the next climb, sorry, this is very much a whistle stop tour. Uh, the next um, climbers to try Kanchenjunga, not, not till a lot later, at the end of the 20s, early 30s, there were two expeditions led by a German called Paul Bauer. He's the guy on the left. Um, he had a very, very strong climbing team from Munich. Um, they went to the other side of the mountain um, from Crowley and, and tried to climb a feature called the Northwest Spur. Uh, which they hoped would get them onto the North Ridge and towards the summit. They, they climbed heroically. Bauer's books were fantastic. The articles he wrote afterwards, um, Alpine Journal editor Colonel Strutt, who wasn't a man to suffer fool gla fools gladly, uh, said it was the kind of most astonishing achievement in mountaineering, uh, but they didn't get to the top. Um, the, the next person to have a go was another German and um, that's uh, Gunter Dierenfurth, the guy on the right in the Solar Topi. Um, his wife, um, Hetty Dierenfurth, 
who was a tennis champion, this is not a snowshoe, this is one of a tennis rackets, went with them. And so did uh, Frank Smythe, the British climber. Um, Dyer and Firth again put together a very, very strong team of Swiss climbers and German climbers and Frank Smythe. But um, they went onto the northwest face, uh, this side which had been advocated by Douglas Freshfield, but similarly they were totally unsuccessful. And again, the expedition ended with um, an accident in which somebody died or uh, an avalanche. Um, then in the 1950s, you have the golden age of Himalayan climbing when all of the world's big peaks were climbed. So you see Lachadeli on the summit of K2, Tenzing obviously, Herman Bull who climbed Nanga Parbat. So the kind of last bit of unfinished business, if you like, was Kanchenjunga and the question was, who was going to climb it? Um, so the book that I've done, the first half is about these early expeditions and it deals with them quite quickly. And then the second half is all about 1955. Um, and th the first person who wanted to climb it was in the centre, it was John Hunt, um, because he, he had been the successful leader of the 53 Everest expedition. And he really passionately wanted to get a Kanchenjunga. He'd been there in the 30s. And um, he got money from the Mount Everest Foundation to do so. And, uh, but he had a problem, which was that he wanted to go in 1956, but he needed to have a recce of the mountain in 1955, and he couldn't do it. And so he got in touch with two climbers who were then in uh, the Barun Valley, um, Ed Hillary and Charles Evans. Uh, both of them had been on the 53 Everest expedition, obviously. And he asked, would, would either of them want to, to lead this reconnaissance? Um, Ed Hillary couldn't, he'd recently been in an, um, in an accident. Charles Evans could. Um, it's kind of interesting, it's a little bit poignant seeing the picture of Tenzing here. Obviously, Tenzing lived in Darjeeling at this point and would have seen Kanchenjunga every day, but there was never a kind of suggestion that he could have been part of the Kanchenjunga team, uh, which is a bit sad, really. But whether he would have wanted to go or not, that's a sort of different question, probably not. Um, Charles Evans put together a very strong team um, of climbers, several of which who'd either been reserves for or had almost made it to the Everest 53 expedition. Um, there was Tony Strether at the back on the left who'd been on K2 with Charlie Houston, Norman Harvey, Hardy, a strong New Zealand climber, George Band in the middle who'd had a bad time on Everest because he had a very bad stomach complaint, Tom McKinnon, uh, John Clegg on the far right and in the bottom row Neil Mather, John Jackson, there's Charles Evans, and then uh, Joe Brown, the kind of wild card of the team. He was a sort of Theo Walcott of, of this expedition because he was much younger than anybody else. Um, and, uh, um, and he was a sort of, you know, he, he had had a fantastic season in the Alps, but he, he was a surprising choice for many, but Charles Evans was sure that he was the, the right guy. Um, Unlike Paul Bauer and, and Dyeron Firth, they attacked the mountain from the southwest, on the southwest face, um, the same route that Crowley had used in, or the same approach that Crowley had used in 1905. And it's, it's very interesting to, to read Crowley's account and try and work out whether some of the features uh, that he identified were the same features that they identified um, to get to the summit. Um, Crowley had been very much disparaged uh, over the years, but it's kind of interesting the, the way he wrote about it and then in a way had quite a similar sort of approach. Um, they had a very strong team of Sherpas with them. Again, several had been on the, uh, the 53 Everest expedition, climbed very high. Dawa Tenzing on the far right was a great friend of Charles Evans's and a very experienced Urkian, Analu, again, very experienced, strong Sherpas who they got on very well with. Um, they set up base, their base camp after a, a bit of exploration at um, uh, Pash's grave, the site where the Swiss climber had been buried in 1905 um, and started up. Like all expeditions from this era, it was a bit of a battle uh, to try and get up before the monsoon hit. Uh, the first task was to get through the ice fall at the bottom. They had a, a week of explorations where things didn't work out and then finally uh, worked out how to do it. Um, as they got climbed higher and higher up the mountain, the kind of key issue was to avoid avalanches. Uh, uh, Kanchenjunga, sorry, is very avalanche prone. That's how a lot of people get killed on the mountain. At one stage, um, George Band counted uh, 48 avalanches in a 24-hour period. So this was a kind of constant worry. 
Um, they took oxygen. This was something that um, Charles Evans insisted upon, even though he'd had quite a bad time with oxygen himself in, in 1953. And arguably, he could have got to the summit of Everest if it hadn't been for a malfunctioning oxygen set. Um, but he was convinced that they needed oxygen. The sets were slightly better than in 53, easier to, to adjust the amount of oxygen, bigger um, cylinders. But still, at this kind of period, constant problems, things going wrong. Um, this is Tony Strether. He had a torrid time uh, when he successfully reached the summit on the, on the second day with his oxygen set, but still managed to do it. Um, a big thing on all, all of these climbs from this era were very much team efforts. Big issue was getting all the equipment and supplies and tentage up to, to a point from which the summit teams could strike out for the summit. Here are some photographs from some very exhausted looking Sherpas. Tom McKinnon and John Jackson led this heroic, uh, really tough carry to get um, as much stuff as possible, as high as possible on this feature called the Great, the great Shelf. There was a, 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 a bad storm, a lot of it seemed to be avalanched away, but uh, um, they managed to find it in the end. As they got towards the top, this is some photographs from the, the final day, I think, um, the, the conditions changed and you got much more rock further down the mountain. It was mainly snow, but the higher up you got, you got a lot of rock. On the right, there's the famous chimney, I think, uh, which, um, or Joe, the crack that Joe Brown climbed. Um, on the left, I love that kind of, those very precisely cut steps, very impressive. Um, and then they got to the top. And uh, so the first two climbers to get there were George, Brown, George Band and, and Joe Brown. Um, right at the beginning of the expedition, Charles Evans had actually had to go to, the, to visit the Maharaja of Sikkim. And uh, because basically the Sikkimese didn't really want any expeditions on the mountain. In the 1930s, the problem had always been to persuade the Nepalese to get permission, but in the 1950s, the problem was, was with the Sikkimese. And so they came up with an agreement um, that they wouldn't actually tread on the highest point. Hence, uh, um, Charles Evans's book afterwards, uh, uh, Kanchenjunga, The Untrodden Peak. Um, the, this is the, the, the climbers. It was a very successful, very cohesive group. Uh, photograph from 1990. Uh, uh, Tom McKinnon had died by this point, but all of the others was, had survived. Charles Evans, unfortunately, was struck down by multiple cirrhosis, but he was a, a great guy who just kind of kept on going, kept his spirits up. Uh, and there's Joe Brown on the far right. And um, what's lovely about um, Charles's account, and there's a, a beautiful article that he wrote in the Times at the end, where he just talked about how they were all very cohesive Sherpas and climbers, uh, but they insisted on, on having a lot of fun and a lot of laughs uh, during the expedition. So it was hard, it was tough, but um, they all got on very well. And um, it was a, a great experience for them, great bit of mountaineering. Um, so, and then, okay, so this is the book, The Last Great Mountain. It's um, uh, just come out, but it's, there's been a bit of trouble with coronavirus getting it printed, etc. but anyway. Um, I hope you like it if you do. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, um, and myself back to uh, to Nick and uh, uh, hope I didn't stumble too much. Thank you, Nick. That's superb. Uh, it's really, really interesting. I'm really very much looking forward to reading the book. Good stuff. In the year 2000, 45 years after that first ascent, Royal Navy Captain Stephen Jackson was selected to lead the Armed Forces Millennium Mountaineering Expedition, and they chose the southwest face of Kanchenjunga. If successful, this would be the second British ascent of that same route. Steve is here to tell us how they got on. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was selected to lead the British Service Kanchenjunga Expedition 2000 in 1996, and I was very fortunate. Um, to uh, have help from both George Band and Tony Strether in the planning process. Uh, the team left the UK uh, for Nepal on the 28th of March 2000 and after a tough two-week walk from Sukhothai uh, via Yampudin, uh, we established a base camp at Pasha's grave uh, on the 12th of April. Uh, and I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour um, until 
we get up to the summit bed, which is what the focus of my talk is going to be about. Uh, so the route um, goes up this feature on the left hand side called the hump uh, and then disappointingly drops down. So base camps down here, come up this west buttress onto the hump and then up through the upper ice fall where we'll establish a camp two. Then camp three is on the great shelf. A fourth camp will be established at the bottom of the gangway. Um, the sickle is shown there on the left and the route will go up the gangway and then up onto the main summit. Uh, now, George, as you heard from Mick, um, George had a great deal of concern about this route at the bottom and the avalanche danger. So in the days when we actually wrote letters to each other, um, George wrote to me on the 3rd of December, 98, and described a route uh, which he thought would be safer from avalanche danger uh, to go from base camp up to uh, camp one on the top of the hump. So that's the route that we took um, to the to the right hand edge of the hump and uh, it goes through this rock band which is uh, by Joe Brown standards probably very straightforward but for us was uh, quite tricky. Uh, and then we got a camp established, uh, Camp 1, which is quite a big camp and the camps got smaller as we got higher up the mountain. Uh, from Camp 1 to Camp 2, uh, we gave some um, imaginative names to the to the route, so we called this the steep bit. Um, and then uh, at about 6,800 meters, we established um, Camp 2, which is quite an unpopular camp. It was cold, uh, it was quite windy up there, and we often had to dig the tents out. Uh, and this is very typical of Kanchen Jungle weather. Um, if you can't operate in these conditions, you will not summit on Kanchen Jungle. Things that you, weather that you wouldn't go out in in the Alps, you will have to go out in if you're going to climb Kanchen Jungle. <clears throat> Um, the route from Camp 2 to Camp 3 up onto the Great Shelf, there was a steep introduction um, and then uh, up on the Great Shelf itself, um, the, you could get a good route then of the route up through the sickle and the gangway uh, up onto the main summit. Uh, and this, I think this is a great picture of John Doyle above Camp 3. Um, and in the background, about 100 kilometres away, um, is Mount Everest. So the summit team, <coughs> excuse me, um, got up to uh, Camp 4 um, and the plan on the 11th of May was for a load carry by uh, four of the team, John Doyle, Dan Carroll, Ian Vedables and A.D. Cole, along with our four Sherpas, uh, Pemu, who is the Sirdar, uh, Nima Dorje, Pemba Norbu and Dawa Furi. Uh, to go from Camp 2 via Camp 3 to finish setting up Camp 4. Uh, <clears throat> and then descend to await uh, a decision to mount a summit attempt. Uh, and they were going well and they agreed amongst themselves that if on arrival at Camp 4, the weather, the snow conditions and their physical state were half decent, they would ask me for permission to give them a shot at the summit. The problems began at Camp 3. The Sherpas with the Indian team, uh, which was on the mound, and the Indo-Tibet Border Police, ITBP, had carried to Camp 4 that day, and the last man down had reported deep snow above Camp 3. The Indian team, he said, were retreating down the mountain to wait for better weather and conditions. Not long after their departure, the weather did close in, and the eight of the team, my team, were subjected to a night of heavy snowfall uh, and strong winds in Camp 3. They spoke to me at base camp at 5 a.m. on Friday the 12th as planned and we decided to delay a decision to move for a few hours to see what the weather did. Three hours later, uh, Dan and Ian decided to descend rather than subject themselves to the debilitating effects of another uh, night at that altitude. The others on the mountain had also decided to retreat, that's the other expeditions, because of the bad weather. But I was actually convinced um, from data I was receiving every day from the UK that better weather was on the way. So John, Aidy and the Sherpas decided to remain for another day and see if the weather would indeed improve. And sure enough, some hours later, the ever-present wind um, 
uh, ceased along with the snowfall. So they were now in a position to make further progress uh, the next day. Uh, and two of the porters decided, to, uh, two of the Sherpas decided they want to go to the summit. Um, but Pema and Dawa Furi decided to descend. So <clears throat> on the morning of Friday the 12th, it was fine and clear. And John, Aidy, Nima and Pemba departed to Camp 4 at around 8 a.m. And in contrast to the previous days, they now found themselves underneath the scorching sun as they waded knee deep through snow along the great shelf. And it was four very tired and thirsty men who arrived at Camp 4 six hours later. Once there, Adi and Nima dug out the tent and erected another, while John and Pemba Norbu led off up snow-covered ice uh, to recce the next 100 metres above the camp uh, towards the gangway. The evening was spent making and drinking as many hot drinks as possible to start the rehydration process and also to keep warm as they had no sleeping bags, uh, just one piece down suits. Their night passed with little sleep. And in fact, when John finally managed to drop off, Aidy woke him up to tell him that there was a full moon. All too soon, at uh, two o'clock, their elected departure time arrived. And with the full moon now obscured by the bulk of the mountain, AD led off uh, by the light of his head torch towards the gangway. Uh, and almost immediately, they were sinking knee deep in fresh snow. Nima and Pema pushed to the front to give AD and John a break from trail breaking. And a good rhythm and a routine was soon established with every man taking turns uh, to do his bit. And once on the gangway, even in the darkness, the route became clear. With the sickle to their left, uh, they gained height steadily on the gangway. <coughs> and they, as dawn broke, they started to see uh, prominent features which they recognized from the slides of the 1955 ascent. And at the top of the gangway, at around 10 o'clock, that's just below where AD is there. After eight hours of climbing without rest, the conditions still seem to be against them. The route now took a turn angling upwards and rightwards, steepening and becoming mixed rock and snow. And Nima started up across the massive summit slopes that had looked so small from base camp. And after about 50 meters, shouted down to say that further progress was unlikely. So John radioed me at base camp to discuss the situation. And for a moment, it seemed as though the uh, attempt would go no further. But I said that having timed their progress since dawn, since I could see them, they only looked to be about four hours away from the summit. Uh, and I put no pressure on them to continue. Uh, and I left them to make their own decision. Uh, but meanwhile, the radio call had given them a chance to rest, um, to have a drink and reevaluate things. So they resolved to continue upwards, but only for two hours. They said later that they were very tired, they were dehydrated, they were climbing without oxygen, and they had severe doubts. But the encouragement they received made a difference, so they climbed on. And they're now rocky terrain was a nice change from the deep snow of the gangway. And with the, the sun warming them and the sight of the summit rocks, they knew that barring an accident, they would soon reach the summit. They followed the West Ridge underneath the infamous Brown Crack, which they bypassed and followed the route uh, climbed by Tony Strether and Norman Hardy, which led up to the fine ease, final easy snow slope to the summit. And the summit was reached at a couple of minutes after 2 p.m. And following the tradition of the first ascensionists, they left the summit untrodden. And they'd been blessed. The sky below them, although now starting to, to cloud, had, had remained clear. And, and the violent and ever-present winds 
uh, of the previous month, so clearly visible from base camp, were nowhere to be seen. But they stayed only a short time for handshakes, photographs at a radio call down to base camp. But after seven hours above 8,000 meters, they still had a long way to descend. And it was now starting to get late in the day. AD in particular, aware that he was showing signs of hypoxia, was keen to move downwards. He knew that unroped and at this altitude, now was not the time for him to trip over a crampon. However, he did take a fall twice. And after managing to arrest himself the second time, he waited for John to, to close in for some moral support. John decided to take no chances and he cut an old piece of fixed rope to provide a handrail for Aidy down the last snow slope to the gangway, uh, down to camp four. As they descended, snow avalanche all around them and they also set off small avalanches. In all, the descent to the high camp took just over four hours. <clears throat> and although previously we'd planned to descend straight down to camp four, the four were happy to arrive back at camp four intact uh, and lay exhausted uh, on their sleeping mats for another night but just pleased to have been part of this successful expedition, uh, which was the first ascent by a British expedition since George and Joe on the 24th of May. So uh, that's the very brief story of the British Services Kanchenjunga Expedition 2000. In my assessment, we succeeded because we were a tight knit team of competent climbers uh, who looked out for each other. We had a workable plan. We focused entirely on the task in hand and worked uh, tirelessly to achieve our common goal of climbing Kanchenjunga. So thank you for listening and I'll hand you back to Nick. Thank you Steve. That's fantastic. Brilliant. So finally tonight, folks, uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our final guest. Uh, Gerlinda Kaltenbrunner climbed Kanchenchunga via its southwest ridge in 2006. This was her ninth 8,000 meter summit. And five years later, on K2, she became the first woman ever to climb all 14 without the use of supplementary oxygen. Gerlinda is joining us from close to Salzburg. Um, it's an honor to have you with us. Are you there, Gerlinda? Yes, uh, hello, hello Nick, hello everybody. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here and to take you with me now, um, yeah, to Kanchen Zenga. Um, you know, Kanchen Zenga uh, for me was one of the most difficult mountains uh, beside K2. And uh, yeah, it was a very long dream to climb Kanchenzunga also. Uh, I tried with my team already in 2003 uh, from the north side without uh, reaching the top. And in 2006, uh, we started again. We were a four member team. Uh, Ralph, my former partner, was with me. Also, Weka Gustafsson from Finland, um, Hiro Daka, Takayushi from Japan. So we uh, were already uh, quite. Um, uh, it was a, a big challenge to reach base camp uh, for 10 days. We were hiking in uh, with um, around um, 32 borders. And just before uh, the um, reaching base camp, one day before, um, most of the borders uh, left uh, our team because they heard that there are very difficult circumstances and it's too dangerous. So only around 15 boarders were left and they supported us uh, towards base camp. And you see it here already to base camp. Um, yeah, a little bit of snow, but uh, rocky sections. So uh, they did really, really a great job. We were very grateful to have them with us. And already one week before us, we team reached the uh, base camp at 5,000, around 300 meter. We had our base camp. The Swiss team uh, led it by Norbert Jos, and they told us that uh, there's snowfall every day. And also, we uh, were sitting seven days after reaching base camp in base camp because of 
uh, snowfall, heavy snowfall every day. And so we um, decided uh, not to acclimatize on a 7,000 meter peak nearby. We wanted to do that. Um, we thought it would be stupid and also unfair. Uh, if we uh, lose energy um, breaking trail on a 7,000 meter peak and the Swiss team would do the work uh, on Kanchen Sunga. So we spoke with the team, with the Swiss team, and we worked very well together. So, but before starting uh, climbing the mountain for me, and I think for the whole team, it's very important to do the um, Buddhist ceremony, the pusher ceremony. Uh, it's always very nice and, and very important for me to have this. I think everybody know this uh, ceremony. Yeah, and then we started our climb. We uh, went up, uh, have put, um, not put camp one because we had always our two member tent with us and we carried up and down. We did not uh, install high camps um, as it is maybe usual for some expeditions. Uh, so we were very lightweight because we had no Sherpas or high altitude borders with us. We carried uh, all by our own and so we tried to to bring um, very lightweight gear of course. 6,100 meter in Camp 1. We have spent two nights up there for a good acclimatization and uh, then uh, we went up towards um, uh, Camp 2 and it's really amazing. It's so beautiful because just behind maybe most of you of you know this mountain behind it's Janu Janu uh, uh, I think very difficult 7,000 meter peak. Uh, it's really very fascinating there. And so, um, as you heard already before, there are uh, some steep sections and here from the hump, uh, you have to climb down. Whereas the rocky part, just uh, below the rocky part, you traverse and then uh, you go first flat and then into uh, the ice fall. Yeah, uh, for me, it seemed uh, very varied uh, the whole expeditions you have very steep parts uh, but uh, change afterwards with very flat sections here on the right you see uh, for the swiss climbers coming up uh, the steep uh, snow slope and then you go completely flat so it was really on one hand nice to have uh, flat sections but on the other hand of course we had to break trail uh, sometimes uh, a lot up uh, to almost uh, yeah, knee height or more and sometimes when the wind has blown away the snow it was a little bit better. Yeah, we went uh, through the ice fall and camp two we have set or our little tent we have set at 7000. Mm, it was around 250 meter and this for me was such an impressive um, place because the little tiny tent and you have the huge Kanchen Tsunga uh, south face in front of you. It really it was so, uh, it was really very impressive uh, all the time for me. Mm, the whole Kanchen Tsunga Massif. Yeah, and also Hirotaka and Waker, they had a very tiny tent. Um, the last uh, camp or the last uh, time we went down again and up and down. And uh, while our summit attempt, uh, we slept 6-1, uh, then 7,250, and the last at uh, 7,700. And from there, we started for the summit attempt. And uh, yeah, here you see the last part one more time of Kanchen Tsunga, the last few hundred meters, it was our route. and. Um, it was really tough because just below the summit, you all know there is uh, a part uh, where you have to climb down a little bit and every meter down and up, uh, up there is really, you know, without bottled oxygen, very, very exhausting. But also a very beautiful view. Uh, on our summit day, we were not really lucky with the weather. We had very, very misty conditions. We had to break trail, but we worked very well together with uh, the Swiss team. They were, um, I think, five climbers. And um, this is the difficult rocky part. And I remember very well, uh, I thought just up there behind, I did not really have in my mind, I just thought, up that must be close to the summit, very close to the summit. And when we came up there on the right side, you have to traverse to the left. And then um, there was a huge, uh, yeah, 
um, period, a huge part uh, still in front of us, uh, some more hours of climbing. Um, yeah, uh, the Australian Andrew Locke was also uh, on the mountain. Um, we shared uh, the permit with him together with a Portuguese climber behind Waker Gustafsson, my teammate also. And um, yeah, this is just close to the summit after climbing down and up uh, the last section towards uh, the summit. And you can imagine uh, it was for me and I think for the whole team a very fulfilling moment uh, to reach the top of uh, Kanchen Tsengar. So many years I dreamed about it and uh, it was so fascinating for me because I did the last steps then also up and did a photo down to the north side where we tried to climb already in 2003. And yeah, it was very, very moving. Uh, so then also um, the Norbert Jos uh, came up with his team. And you know Norbert, I remember he wanted to turn back just uh, below the summit when you have to climb down again. He thought, no, I don't do it. I turn around and we told him, no, that it's so close, it's so close. And it was really so nice to see how happy also he was to reach the top. So we were to get up there, it was snowing, it was windy, but also very bright, uh, like sunshine is coming also. So uh, very special conditions up there and the tremendous view down to the Yalongkang. Oh, it was really, it was really amazing. And you know, um, I have to say kind of stupid of mine because I told to my teammates, okay, and now we only have to climb down, only climbing down and we, then we made it. And while climbing down, we had so terrible, difficult conditions because uh, uh, we had so gusty conditions, a big storm came up and we almost didn't find uh, 7,700 where we have put our little uh, tent. We made it flat because we thought already if the wind is coming, then our uh, tent will fly away. So it was already dark and just before reaching um, the, the place, Ralph fell into a crevasse. Uh, we could bring him out and then it was so stormy that we couldn't um, establish our tent um, anymore. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the picture climbing down and up again and then down. And um, so we just went into our um, tent, but without establishing only the, the skin of the tent. And, um, and then I have to say, we were not able to cook anything. We couldn't establish the tent. We were just lying inside completely flat because of the storm. And uh, these hours, they were really, really, really uh, very difficult for me because I could really feel um, when the, the cold came to the center of my body. And I first I was still shaking and then shaking stopped. And I thought, oh my God, I was praying, please, uh, I hope the wind will stop that we can establish the tent and we can start cooking. And I was so kind of frozen and at four o'clock in the morning, the wind stopped completely and we could establish our small tiny tent and then we could start the, the cooker. And um, I think you can imagine uh, how the first uh, sip of hot water worked for me. It, I could feel with every sip that my, my life energy came back and um, I was just happy to drink hot uh, as much as I could. And also Ralph, of course, we were together in a tent. And then, yeah, we packed all our gear and uh, we climbed down. And uh, on, only in the evening, we were close um, to our uh, base camp and our kitchen boy and our cook, they came up to support us to bring the gear down. It was the best thing ever. and. Whew, yes, uh, it was uh, for me, for us, a very tough uh, climb. We were really exhausted and so super happy when we finally made it um, uh, to back to our base camp. And, you know, uh, I really thought afterwards so stupid uh, to say, ah, now we have to climb only down. One more time I saw and I realized that 
the summit starts at the highest point but ends only when you're back in base camp uh, safe and healthy. Yeah, so I hope um, you understood everything and you enjoyed my short um, story about our Kanchenzunga expedition. It uh, was uh, yeah, really great to share my story with you and now I'm going to hand over to Nick again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gelinda. Sorry, I think I was uh, on mute. So I just wanted to repeat uh, my thanks. Really felt like we were kind of with you there on the mountain and those photos were fantastic. Thank um, you. Thanks too to Leo, Mick and, and Steve. And uh, now folks, it's time for questions. If I may, Galinda, I'll just start off. Um, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, of all the, of all the uh, 8,000 meter peaks, um, which one would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, you know, um, every 8,000 meter peak uh, uh, is very fascinating for me, uh, of course, but if you are um, a very enthusiastic good climber, I really would recommend the north side of K2. Uh, it's from the Shakskam Valley. It's such a remote place, nobody there, and really a steep, uh, yeah, challenging climb. Uh, very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it looks like we've got our first question, which is Zoe. It's a question for um, Jolinda. Um, it was, first of all, just it, like really inspiring. Um, to see a woman climbing all of those mountains as well. I know that sounds really, really sexist, so apologies, that is a very sexist comment, um, but it was inspiring. Um, and my question for you is, did you ever suffer with um, frostbite? And what, obviously you talked about when you were in the tent, like being that cold. Um, how did you sort of protect yourself from the cold on, on that mountain and on some of the other mountains that you've done? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for your question. Luckily, I never had uh, serious frostbites. Uh, one time on Gashabrum 2, um, I could feel a little bit in my toes, but you know, I always really uh, focus very much on feeling my feet and, and fingers. And if I don't feel anymore, this is the most dangerous because uh, yeah. Those bites are not hurting in the beginning. You don't feel anything. And I always try to drink as much as I can to uh, maintain blood circulation. And if I don't feel the feet and fingers anymore for a long time, then I, um, I turned back also to warm up my fingers and feet uh, again, because I never, I, in the beginning already, I thought I never uh, won't lose one single uh, finger or two. So this is, uh, was always very important for me. And you know, uh, maybe everybody know, knows that uh, you can do also mentally quite a lot to keep your fingers or your feet warm uh, if you are not warm, but not frozen, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. and of yeah. course, also very good material, uh, good shoes. It, they are not uh, warm up there at, in a bivouac uh, on K2 North Face, for example, at 8,300, but at least you don't get frostbite. Mm. Yeah, no, that's really cool. thank you. So our next question comes from Richard Pelly. Go ahead, Richard. Can Steve hear me? Yeah, it's a long time since Steve and I have spoken, and I know some of the things he's been up to beforehand. I wondered, Steve, whether that expedition you regarded as your greatest challenge. Richard, thanks. Um, nice to see you. Uh, yes, it was my greatest challenge. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, was, I had previously been the deputy leader of the Gashabram 1 expedition in 96, um, and, um, uh, but Kanchenjunga was a different scale. Uh, but I was fortunate, you know, we had a great team. We had, by that time, uh, some, some good climbers in the services. You know, we had some good alpinists, some good um, winter alpinists as well, and, a, uh, and a, a reasonable level of youngish climbers with Himalayan experience from some of the expeditions, you know, some of which you were on before to Everest. Um, but my view of the Himalayas is, and Kanchenjunga is, if you look at A.D. Cole, who summited, he'd never been above 4,000 metres before in his life. Um, so I reckon if you're a good Scottish winter climber, which he was, uh, as long as you can acclimatise, you'll probably be all right in the Himalayas. Thanks, Steve, and thanks for a, a very good presentation. Well done. I've got a, a, another question for Galinda, sorry. So um, it's really just 
a, a question for us at the Alpine Club. Um, do you have any tips? Um, what do you think the Alpine Club could do to encourage more women to get into mountaineering? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I think, um, I hope, and I'm sure you are very open also for women. Uh, I think it's normal. Uh, I spoke uh, already with uh, different women and uh, very good climbers, really very good climbers. And uh, the most reason um, that they, um, yeah, ma, for Alpine Club, you don't uh, need to climb 8,000 meter peaks. But when I thought uh, climbing on expedition, um, they always say about two months off and they like to have family also, and they are very involved to families and also to handle with the very cold circumstances is oft, uh, often quite difficult. But for the Alpine Club, you don't need to be an 8,000 meter peak climber. <laughs> so um, just, um, invite them and offer them to come uh, and then I think nothing else to do. They, they will come. <laughs> How many women do you have? I don't know exactly. Uh, that's a very good question. I, I, I would need to ask Victor that question. Um, we're, we're hoping to, um, we noticed, uh, I was noticing recently there's a, a big anniversary next year for the 150th anniversary since the first ascent of the Matterhorn. Um, okay. By way. Um, and uh, so we're, we're hoping to do something with that perhaps, but, um, but thanks mm -hmm. for your thoughts. I've um, got a question now from um, Michael. Michael wants to ask uh, a question for Leo. Yeah, yeah, for Leo. Um, so um, I know part of your access to these amazing climbers like Joe has just been being friends with them, climbing together with you know, all sorts of people and going to the places, but it's also you've managed to get really good interviews with them. And I'm just wondering, do you have any advice for anyone who's interested in that kind of thing? What, what, what sort of questions to ask, how to start, how to get that kind of amazing interview? The first thing is to never ask a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it helps if they trust you, if they trust that you are also a climber, maybe not as good as them, but... Uh, I think my uh, my favourite story is when I interviewed Andel Heckmeyer uh, about his ascent of uh, the Eiger. And uh, at the end of the interview, I left it like all good uh, journalists do till the, till the very last question. And I said, what was it like meeting Hitler, shaking hands with Hitler? And he turned the question around on me and he said, um, Leo, when you're Sir Edmund Hillary, or when you're Edmund Hillary met, uh, the Queen, after he climbed Everest, um, she had requested a meeting, and you don't turn down, you don't turn down a, a meeting with the head of state. In my case, meeting Hitler would not have been a good idea to say no, so I had to go meet him. It was a very good answer. Marianne, are you there? Do you want to go ahead with your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, Galinda, it's a question for you. Um, I'm not going to do it in German. I am very, very tempted. Um, so my question, on your second last picture, you and your partner, Ralph, you look um, quite worn out, and you mentioned that Ralph actually fell into a crevasse. Having met my own wife in the mountains and we climbed together, I wonder when you climb with your partner, do you behave differently on the mountain? Do you climb differently, maybe more cautious? Are you more careful when you climb with your life partner? Um, I think, um, good question, but uh, I try always to be very careful, not only when uh, I climbed with my former partner, Ralph, uh, also when I climbed with David uh, Gertler, for example, we are always uh, very attentive and uh, you know the only thing is uh, we had also situations um, when we had were not at the same um, Ralph wanted to turn back and I wanted to continue climbing and in situations like this it's sometimes quite difficult with uh, a life partner to to separate or to split up on the mountain for example yeah but um, there are a lot of advantage, uh, uh, disadvantages and also uh, good things, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. 
There's a question from Nigel. It may be from YouTube or it may be from Nigel Buckley himself. Go ahead, Nigel. I have three questions. And um, they're all from YouTube and they're all from all, all for Galinda. So, sorry, Galinda. Um, you're taking the brunt. Um, I have uh, Jeanette McGill from Melbourne, Australia. And uh, she says, thank you, Galinda. Very inspiring. Which of the 14 8,000ers were the hardest for you? Have you ever used oxygen on any expedition subsequently? So first question, uh, the hardest one uh, was K2 North Spiller. It was uh, really, or K2 uh, was the most difficult mountain for me. Um, I had uh, many attempts on the south side and the last was on the North Spiller. And it was the most difficult, uh, most challenging, but also most beautiful expedition, mm -hmm, I have to say. Yeah, K2. And I never used the uh, bottled oxygen and we also never had oxygen with us. Uh, also, for example, on Everest, uh, we didn't... Um, we didn't have uh, oxygen with us, bottled oxygen, and I always thought if um, I uh, cannot uh, stay without bottled oxygen, then uh, this mountain is too high for me. This was always from the very beginning clear for me, also Mount Everest. I did not know if I'm able to climb up uh, to the top without bottled oxygen, and this uh, meant also to be even more aware about everything, about my body, to listen to my body, that I never overstep uh, my, my limit. And I was lucky on Everest because it was not that much cold. And so I could do also Everest without bottled oxygen. But we also do not have emergency oxygen with us because um, we always climbed without uh, Sherpas also. So also the weight uh, was and this always very important. But uh, I think if you really listen to your body very carefully, you realize when it's time to turn around or uh, you know exactly if you can continue or better turn around. Okay. Um, from Nika, uh, we have... Uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, why did you decide to climb without oxygen? You know, um, I was uh, on my first expedition, I was uh, 23 years old. It was Broad Peak in Pakistan. And I, I had no idea if I would be able to, to climb those high mountains without uh, bottled oxygen and could I carry my backpack by my own. I had no idea. And, um, but at least I wanted to try. And from the very beginning, it was uh, important for me. Okay, I would like to do it with my own energy, with my teammates together. And if my body is not able to to climb up uh, at 8,000 without bottle oxygen, then this mountain is too high for me. It was just a personal decision. Yeah. And I, I, I'm very happy with this. Uh, it feels really good. <laughs> Um, Ian says, um, hello, Galinda. Uh, any training tips for a late starter? I'm 43 and only started climbing a year ago. <laughs> Good. You know, I have a friend. Uh, she started also quite uh, late with high altitude climbing. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's uh, important to have a very a big variation in your training uh, to avoid um, uh, some... To, to avoid uh, problems with your body. And, uh, you know, uh, I can recommend that you do a lot of endurance, power endurance. It's not so important. I did not training to run very fast up the mountain. I uh, always try to train uh, very long distances, uh, ski touring, uh, very long ski tourings. Um, about uh, 10, 14, 15 hours, for example, before uh, studying the expeditions. And uh, never forget uh, to um, regenerate because uh, most uh, people <laughs> uh, who start late, they, uh, they maybe make the mistake to train uh, too much and, uh, and forget to, to regenerate. And so I could recommend uh, try to find out what's the best for you and um, yeah, do a lot in the mountains. That's also important to be a real good all-round mountaineer. Then I think then you are on the good side. <laughs> good stuff. Thank you, Nigel and uh, Galinda. Um, 
I believe Victor has a question. Um, could, could we unmute Victor? Oh, hello, Galinda. Thank you very much. Great talk. Victor, <laughs> hello. I just have a small question here. After completing all the 8,000 meter peaks, that project, what's your next life project? <laughs> Good question. Mm, you know, um, uh, for me, after climbing all 14 8,000 meter peaks, it was clear that I don't want to go back to another uh, 8,000 meter peak, another route, because Beside uh, the good team and the skills and preparation, I had always a big amount of of luck and uh, and a higher energy maybe also who who supported me. And um, but um, now there are so many other beautiful mountains and there are still uh, two in my mind. I would like to go back. And then uh, for me, it's also very important to to develop myself. Um, how to say, Bewusstseinsentwicklung, uh, so uh, to, to bring myself uh, forward with all the experiences from the high mountains. Um, um, for me, it's also very important to support uh, the school projects in Nepal, for example. So still a lot to do, but um, I still feel that the mountains are in my heart and I love climbing, um, yeah like before but no more the very very high mountains mm. oh, it's a great answer climbing for pleasure yeah exactly <laughs> thank you victor thank you victor and uh good uh i think we've just got time for one more um alex metcalf go ahead alex hey linda thanks for the great talk um as far as i believe i think k2 is the final mountain to be climbed during winter at the 8000 meter peaks do you believe it can be done Good question. Just uh, last winter, a friend of mine, Vasily Bivtsov, was uh, again there, the Russians and the Kazakh climbers, the Polish, uh, they all tried already. And I think it is really, I think, yeah, for this it is not yet climbed because I think mm. it's a big, big challenge. It's so terribly cold there, then it's really a difficult climb. And so um, I don't know, maybe one day also somebody will climb, but um, uh, it's all also for me. It's always also the question how they climb, in which uh, style it will be climbed, and yeah, we will see. Good question. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Galinda. I think I'm right. That behind you is a picture of K2. Is that right? Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sen made me this with the North Pillar. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I've, I've also got a picture of K2 behind me. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. nice. Taken by by Doug Scott. So. Uh, folks, we've got one more question coming in from YouTube. Nigel. Um, actually, I have two if we have time. Perfect. Okay, from Wendy Milne. Uh, this is for all the speakers. Um, many thanks. Would each speaker say the name of the most recent route they have climbed? Steve, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I think the last route I did was Commando Ridge down at, um, in Cornwall. Um, I mean, I did serve with the Marines, and um, that's about as much as I can manage nowadays. That's superb. Um, Mick, do you do any climbing these days? Uh, yes, but not for a while. I think the last thing would be um, Cotopaxi in Ecuador. But I can't tell you the name of the route. Um, but yeah. Um, what about you, Leo? <laughs> Very nice. I'm trying to think, but I, I, I seem to remember my wife coming up to the North Col of Everest with me. Um, I just came back from Grossglockner, it's the highest mountain in Austria, and um, we did um, the north face, uh, the Mayal ramp, it was really beautiful. We climbed up uh, with crampons and ice axe and skied down the other side. It was powder just two days ago. <laughs> yeah. From Callum McHugh, um, this is for Galinda. At the start of your high altitude career, how did you manage to stand out so as to be invited on high altitude expeditions? Um, you, uh, you know, um, before I was, uh, if I understood right, before I was working as a nurse, um, and uh, so I collected all my <laughs> my money to to financial the expeditions. And after uh, Nanga Parbat, it was my five, fifth eight thousand meter peak expedition. 
Um, I got, uh, because it was exactly uh, 50 years after the first ascent of Hermann Bull, and so I got first interview requests, and with the interviews I got also first invitations for, for lectures, and so I dared the step uh, to, to, to become professional climber, and in the beginning it was really difficult to, financial, to fi finance everything, but uh, my, uh, and then it worked and so I could uh, at least do every year one 8,000 meter peak expedition and then I got some some sponsors and yeah I'm very happy about it. <laughs> yeah. I think that brings us to the end of the evening so um, thank you all to all of our speakers this, this evening for, for joining joining us. I, I, from a personal point of view I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, it's the only 8,000 meter peak I've seen sort of in the flesh. So um, extremely inspiring, thank you. Um, next week's Alpine Clubcast number 10 is entitled The Playground of Europe, Forbes, Tyndall and Le Blonde, a celebration of three mountaineers of the golden age with a scientific slant. Nana Carlant, Sir Roland Jackson and Rachel Hewitt talk about the achievements of three great Victorians. Do have a look at the Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, like and share all the previous Alpine Club casts. And thanks all for joining us. Keep safe, keep active and keep alert. And please unmute yourself now so we can applaud tonight's speakers. Good night from London. Thank you.